hey, just uh, FYI, the, um, the GitHub page still has the old Zoom session on it. Okay, thanks for some. I'll go open a pull request for that right now. All right, that's all fixed. Thanks, man. No problem. Hey, um, <clears throat> open EBS team. Are you, you guys out there? Is it Jeffrey? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Hey. Okay. So I think I, I had you slotted for the next session to uh, talk about open EBS. Uh, yes. I'm not getting a ping from the mini IO guys quite yet. I'm not quite sure where they are. Um, were you guys at all ready to be able to do it today or are you not ready at all to be able to do that? Well, actually, uh, not at all, because um, <clears throat> one of the uh, so Kieran, who is yep. mostly on this call, uh, yep. was actually three days out on vacation. Yep. And um, so, unfortunately, no. Okay, not a problem at all. Okay. Not a problem. Thanks. We'll give it a few more minutes here, and I'm trying to ping these guys in the back end, and we will see where they're at. Thank you. Okay. But I'm, uh, I'm definitely assuming for the, the 31st, you guys will be all, or the 28th, you'll be all ready to go. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, folks. We have uh, Mini IO who's going to be presenting to us this AM. Um, I haven't gotten a ping from them quite yet, so I'm checking to see what's going on. But uh, we'll hang out here for another couple minutes and then uh, go from there. Thank you.
Hey, Basam, you out there? I am. All right. Uh, maybe I was going to put you on the spot here as I, I wait to get a ping from the, uh, the IO guys. Uh, I wanted to maybe open it up and, and ask you about the, uh, the experience so far with, with Rook and NCF and how the, uh, the past couple of weeks have been. Any, uh, anything you can share with us? Uh, well, I mean, it's mostly business as usual. Um, I think the uh, events leading up to the announcement and um, a lot of things had to happen to get all the source code repos transferred over and all the administrative stuff um, around it. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time on that. Um, and it's not even done yet. Um, but otherwise, it's, you know, uh, pretty much, you know, business as usual. <laughs> so. Have, uh, in terms of, like, collaborators and contributors, is there anything uh, in the past couple of weeks that's changed in terms of people being interested or talking about different platforms that may be relevant to Rook? Yeah, I mean, I think there is definitely more interest. Uh, I mean, there's been more more interest leading up to, you know, the KubeCon, and that continues to be the case. Um, we're thinking more right now, as part of getting into the CNCF, we're looking into how to update our governance um, and, you know, help enable more folks to, to join the party. Um, there's also where, you know, the Red Hat team has kind of stepped up to help with Brooke. Um, and there are more folks that have expressed interest in, you know, uh, supporting it commercially or uh, as part of their portfolio of products. So, uh, yeah, I think overall, very, very happy with progress so far. Cool. Excellent to hear. All right. Um, still waiting for many other guys. Is, uh, does anybody out there have any, anything that they wanted to chat about? Any questions or any conversation you want to have? Mm, no? Okay. Uh, in terms of the, the TOC, uh, you know, we got a presentation, I did a presentation to you guys on, on Rexray, and we are planning to submit that to the TOC or at least have a discussion at the TOC next week. Uh, so I'll be presenting it there and then we'll request uh, at that point that uh, we get an invite for doing a proposal. Uh, does anybody have anything they wanted to chat about regarding Rexray? Any, any questions or any, any concerns? No concerns, but was that uh, recorded? I, I missed the last meeting. Yeah, it was. It was actually. Um, so there, I think the, the actual GitHub page is a little is behind. I don't think it's been updated in terms of the uh, recordings, but these have all been recorded. So I will ask uh, Chris Anacek to to go to the archives and make sure that he gets the uh, the recordings published on the website. And uh, you can check in with the GitHub page, and you'll be able to pull that up and. and listen to it. Cool, thanks. Yep. Okay, uh, so we, we did have Minio on the agenda. Um, they unfortunately are a no-show this AM, not able to get a hold of them. Uh, unless we have anything else to chat about, I think we can, we can pull this one early and then we can do uh, hopefully two sessions in the two weeks from now on the 28th. So we'll have Hopefully we'll get mini IO to present and we'll, go, we'll also get open EBS to present. Uh, hey, hey, Clint. Hey, yep. Clint. This is or I don't know if my connection is well, but I'm from Minio, so I'm not sure where the other guys are. I'm, I'm working remote, so I'm not with them in the office. Um, but if you want, I can start doing the big presentation. I'm not sure. Um, did you get any connectivity from Verima or? Uh, yeah, I haven't gotten any contact. Um, you're you're a little bit choppy in terms of your voice. Uh, okay, let me dial, let me dial in. And if you don't join by then, I'll I'll get started on the basic overview. Of the okay, sounds good. Okay, right. I'm just dialing in so I get a better connection. Okay, thank you.
for anybody just joining here, we're, we're waiting just a minute for, um, for a dial in to get a better connection so we can hear them. Is this a little bit better or still bad? No, nah, it's still, still pretty choppy. Okay, all right, one more try. Hi, how is this? Is this better? Uh, I I think it's still choppy. Anybody okay. out there? Is it uh, is it choppy for everybody? Yeah, I can barely I make can, it faster. I can I can hear it. All right, all right, guys. I'm gonna try one more last thing. And if that doesn't work, there's something wrong with the services I got. So just give me one more. Time. Okay. All right, this should be a bit better, hopefully. Yes, that's a tremendous right. bit better, so that sounds great. All right, perfect, sorry. <laughs> no problem. All right, so looks like uh, the guys didn't join from the office, right? Yep, not yet, not yet. All right, so Clint, just the expectation wise, this is last week, this is the repeat of what we were trying to do with AB, right? That's correct. Just a high level review. Okay, that's so right. let, me, let me get the, um, documents. I'll just go over what we were planning to present to you guys. Do you, do you just ha share the document or should I just go ahead and share the screen? How do you yeah, want to do it? Share your screen. Uh, it's open for you to do that. Okay. So, so as, uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me set it up real quick here. Um, so I had a chat with the, the mini my IO team about a month ago and uh, you know, we're talking about you know, cloud native. We're talking about you know, what's going on with mini IO. And, you know, I, th I think that they had a, a good perspective on, uh, you know, 
what's important in these environments and, and how storage can fit in the future uh, as these cloud native environments kind of emerge. So I, I asked them to do a, a little bit of a kind of open up about what their perspective is on, on you know, what, what mini IO is going to do in terms of like what market it's going to help fill. Uh, and then also on what mini IO is and you know, where, where some of the successes have been. So that's some of the context for you. Sure. Thanks. So I'm just going to bring up the presentation and get started. Um, give me just 20 seconds. Thank you. Hmm. All right, do you guys see the full screen with the opening page? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, okay, I'll get started. Um, so I, I'm just going to go over and give you guys a general overview of who Minio is, what we do. Um, it's a general introduction if we need to go into details and if I don't know the answers to the questions, we can always get the right people as a follow-up. but. Just wanted to talk to you about you guys about the, how we designed it, the minimum principles behind Minio, and which markets we're playing in, and so on and so forth. So it will be a very high level general. You can stop me anytime you would like, and um, we can go into details um, if you whichever direction you want to take it. So Minio, from the name, as you can see, is based on a minimalist uh, philosophy and. It's really, in most of the cases when we are going and explaining this to enterprise clients, it's kind of hard for us to explain how a cloud native type of a storage solution would play into the future of things. And uh, especially in the storage world, it's kind of hard. But now that we are talking to people who are natively cloud native um, in their mentality, in their philosophy, it's so much easier to talk to a crowd like you guys. So. Essentially, Minio is a very uh, simple, high-performance object storage that's been designed with the cloud-native architectural and design principles in mind. Um, second page is just going over the, as most of you guys probably heard and know, it's about the, um, the waves of the changes that's happening in the storage world, from the disk to the appliance to the cloud. Um, Minio was established as a private cloud alternative for an Amazon S3 type of um, storage solution. Minio is 100% S3 compatible, and we take all of the S3 um, principles and S3 uh, compliance into to the heart, and we always try to make sure that um, S3 compliance is first and utmost. And then sometimes we even uh, implement things that are a little bit different or we improve some of the things that S3 didn't really go further in our thought and that's always the case with us. We always make sure that S3 compliance um, is, is at the center of all of the things we do at Minio. This picture is just showing you guys that you know how the growth of storage is doing especially with the growth in IoT um, and other things that are generating a lot of video, especially IoT, generating a lot of data. And the shift is everybody is moving towards the cloud, whether it's public, private, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, and all of the buzzwords that you see in the industry. This is just trying to explain the 
the effort is going in that direction or the trends are going in that direction. Everybody's numbers are different, but that's just a directional uh, presentation of what's going on. This slide number three is where I wanted to focus on. Um, sorry, this, I'm going to just turn off the notifications so it doesn't disturb you guys. All right, so essentially Minio Cloud Storage, uh, we always aim for the Amazon S3 alternative for all of the things that you see in the, at the bottom. And Minio has a very vibrant community. And just recently we hit a very, in our opinion, very key milestones, which are 10,000 uh, stars on the GitHub, as well as we just passed the 50 million downloads on Docker Hub. Um, we are very happy and very proud of our community and the uh, work that they've done and the support they've shown uh, Minio in the last couple of years until we came here. And we are just in the early days of our commercialization for enterprise enterprise customers. And essentially, we segment this into two by public cloud and private cloud. And we have done a lot of work in terms of the integration up to this point. We've done work with Microsoft Azure, for example. We have integrated with their managed service offerings. Uh, you can essentially run Minio software on Microsoft's uh, Azure as a managed application. And the way it works is if you were to write a, write some code that's um, working on S3 in the past and for multiple reasons, I call this the Walmart syndrome, for multiple reasons you were forced to change a cloud vendor from Amazon into Azure and your, um, your software is written more for S3 compliance and S3 command set and then you need to really go into blob and make sure that your blob data is enabled and usable for your use case, then what we do is we essentially sit on top of Microsoft blob storage and make it S3 compliant and make it look like S3 server, S3 storage system. And that's kind of one of the neat things and very interesting to certain customer um, segment and they immediately their data immediately becomes S3 compliant, whether they go to one cloud or another cloud. <clears throat> so that's kind of a neat thing that uh, we've been integrating. Same thing with the other cloud vendors, as you can see, that's similar integration. And sometimes people, just because Minio is very simple and the binary is tiny binary, that people really take it for simple environments. It's just single tenant. If you want distributed mode or a single tenant mode, you can just run it very simply. Some people even run it on Amazon S3, Amazon AWS using an EBS. And we kind of advise them not to kind of do that because there's no need if once you have S3 in it with an AWS, no need to really run Minio. But because of the simplicity of Minio, certain um, users, especially in the community, prefers to do that. So on the other side, go ahead. Quick question, if I may. Yep. Uh, how, how exactly is it deployed on uh, as an adapter in these different clouds, Azure and Google Cloud? So in terms of the Microsoft Azure, we did a full-blown customized implementation because I'm not sure if you, if you have looked at the way that Microsoft um, did their managed services offering. Um, they basically made it like a, um, ISVs can do a SaaS type of offering where you um, lock down, a, not lock down, but you pick your VM, you pick your VM configuration, you pick how your, your load balancer, so on and so forth. And then you create a templified, very close environment that's just for your software. So that's kind of their new version of, there are multiple, there's a couple of different variations in Microsoft Marketplace, but that's how they do it. So our implementation is kind of a specialized, customized packaging for Azure. It's not, it's it, because it just only works on Azure because they, they dictate their conditions. The same for the Google Cloud. We are on the launch pad or the, the section that Google has a very lighter version of this managed hosting type of environment. So they just don't, they basically do a bring your own license type of a, you can just launch the application or put the application on top of it. it's much lighter 
Microsoft is the one that's deeper. So we just went full pledge um, managed services offering there. So, so we had to do some customized work on that. So when the application launches, or at least the, the VM templates that you guys specify for mini IO in those clouds, is, yep. it, is it using Kubernetes or, or is it just running mini IO? On uh, uh, that's on the right side. I didn't get to that one. We, we are so flexible. So we definitely do storage and we leave the orchestration to Kubernetes when in the right, in most cases, when we suggest to an implementation. That's on the right side where private cloud, we have the Kubernetes integration, we have the cloud native, and it's a, let me so call it this lightweight integration, which is the Helm or the uh, file, basic the file generation, and then just launching the, launching the Minio as you wish in terms of the configuration you put, especially like in the Minio.io website, you can just go in and put your configuration and create the YAML file and then you just use that to launch. And we live, we, we left the orchestration and all the work that we don't do well to outside orchestration engine and Kubernetes is what we go with and what we like to do. Same with Docker Swarm. You just go and create a Swarm file and you just use that to launch and you modify. It's about 20 megabyte of binary that we have and we, we just lightly integrate it into these systems so that we have the flexibility for different same with Cloud Foundry, with Pivotal, same with uh, other, with Mesosphere. We did all these light, I call it light integration, but we, it requires a lot of testing and integration work. Then the users of those systems can do that. And we just do what we do best, doing the storage, which is durable storage, doing the erasure coding, doing it in a light way with no metadata and a very performant high performance way. Those are the things that we shine and those are the things that we do well and we know how to do well. So we don't really claim to be doing the work of Kubernetes in terms of uh, launching it and orchestrating it, multi-tenancy and so on and so forth. We just do all the storage necessities that's required and that's what we focus on. I hope that kind of answers the question. For the other ones though, Microsoft Azure, that was a special case where we had to do custom integration because Microsoft managed services dictate certain conditions. So on the uh, private cloud side, if you deploy on something like a Kubernetes cluster, are you, uh, uh, how are you backing the store? Is it like a host path? Are you using local storage? So what we, we can do two couple of ways. One is let's say that this, we are responsible for the durability of the story. So we do erasure coding and that's what we do best in terms of um, going across multiple disks or multiple servers. And we, we kind of provide the uh, durability of the storage that way. So we are responsible for the durable storage, but in the back end, we can use XFS, let's say in the local file system or Minio has a gateway Modes we call it internally gateway mode, but it can sit on top of other file systems. Let's say in that private cloud range, you can see EMC Isolon. It can sit on EMC Isolon, or the same thing with Blob. Actually, we sit native. We basically write. We don't modify any of the content, whether it's an Isolon or Microsoft Azure Blob. We leave the contents, whether it's file system or not, we leave them unmodified. So. The good thing with Minio is we don't write it in any proprietary form or format into the backend. Therefore, you can access the same Isolon file using the file access mode, or file access uh, protocols, or in Microsoft Azure, you can use blob native protocols and you can still access the same file. But in the front end, you serve it as S3 compliance storage and you do put get and all the other S3 things that you want to do, it will still work. And is the backend uh, pluggable? Meaning if I deploy on Kubernetes on top of, for example, Google Cloud, uh, could I use the backend as GCS? The backend of uh, Minio, you mean? Right. Yeah, so backend will be, we already take the backend and basically you need the backend blob or Kubernetes uh, GCS uh, 
storage and you distribute across them and we do our own just similar to think about it as Linux XFS local file system and you have six of them, 12 of them, multiple, many of them. And Minio writes the erasure coding across all those disks. The same thing in Google Cloud. You just provide the Google Cloud persistent disks and you use them as entities or equivalent of the physical disks. And Minio will do the erasure coding across all of them and put it into a pool. Um, so that, my question was uh, slightly different. It's yep. I understand that you could deploy Kubernetes on Google Cloud and then you could use PDs to back Minio. Mm -hmm. uh, question was, could you also uh, change it to point to uh, the, the Google blob storage GCS instead of PDs? Um, so I do, so I'm not, so the thing is, Yes, uh, to start with, but I got to be careful because Google also provides their own S3. So that's why I'm kind of confused. Why would you want to do that? But if you're saying that you're not using Google's S3 and you want to use Minio S3 backhanded by Google Star Storage, um, I got to double check on that, but I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a similar thing. Uh, the, the reason I never thought about it is Google has a poor implementation, in my opinion, of uh, S3 already. So that wasn't, I was always focusing on using Google EBS or persistent disk. So I, I understand your question, but I, I got to double check on that to be sure. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Just to continue on that, all the other versions of private cloud is basically either you know, orchestrations like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or Intel JBOF. Like we, we are also uh, trying to kind of educate and change the user base behavior into using more solid state disks, provides enabled with the, 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 the software we have that utilizes certain um, certain uh, performance um, factors within the chipset and especially in Skylake with Intel JBOF or any SSD JBOF, just bunch of flash arrays or instead of just bunch of disks, we use the just bunch of flash arrays nowadays and you can use any of these technologies to have a supercharged uh -huh. object storage. Normally in the marketplace, people look at object storage as tertiary or uh, secondary storage or a backup endpoint. We're trying to explain to the market or change the thinking around block storage in a way that SSD enabled with very fast erasure coding and very fast, fast throughput. Nowadays, people are going to multiple 25 gigs or 100 gigs. We believe that the way people, especially in the cloud native world, especially in the newer generation of databases from CouchDB to MongoDB to all sorts of other databases that are S3 compliant in the backend, people are going to change their behaviors and, and the enterprise will come soon as well that they are going to use databases more of snapshot targets with a high performance um, high performance object when it's provided, whether it's in private cloud or public cloud. And that changes early days in my opinion, but we see that as a, as a trend in the market slowly happening in some of the forward thinking areas. And the other isolon I mentioned, VMware, as well as um, a, a recent kind of a um, compatible uh, storage, you can run it on top of vSAN as well. So the other slides are about which I mentioned, the Minio popularity in the development community with the, Slack mem the number of um, stars that we had, as well as the pools, Docker pools um, is a nice number to track. Uh, however, it repeats as you can imagine, but still it's a very good number compared to some of the other um, like some of the in, in open source storage world clearly we are uh, getting some traction and compared to other projects uh, we're still we believe in a good place and the trajectory is very um very good in terms of where it's going 
Do you guys have any uh, large scale deployments that you can uh, share? In terms of the enterprise, we just in the early days of our kind of commercial enterprise deployments, we have a couple of POCs that's in the works, but they are not in production yet. So, and plus we don't have the approval from those large clients, uh, financial and others that uh, they're, they're shy ones. I used to be working at a financial firm and they never want to talk about it. <laughs> so, um, but we don't, um, we are just in the early days. That's, um, but in the community, we have um, a lot of references and uses just in the commercial side. We just starting that journey, just to be fair. Sorry. Sounds good. I, I don't have any specific that I can point no, out good. at Thank this you. point. All right. So basically, I, I think I covered some of these features to distribute it the erasure coding that we do, bit rot protection. These are all the things that most of the commercial classical object storage software vendors are already doing. And we have to do that already. These are baseline in our opinion. So you already know that Minio is S3 compatible. We provide the erasure coding and bit rot protection. Um, we are also changing to highway hash in our bridge, which is a different algorithm that provides um, much more performance in terms of the the way um, the bit road, uh, the erasure code has been done. In terms of the bit road, this is a concept in the in the object storage world where you have the disk, um, basically mechanical aspects of the disk state going bad and uh, changing the, the the parity on the on the bits. And we do that. Um, that's kind of the, the things that you have to do in order to be a very durable and strong object storage and distributed mode. I mentioned that, which is the, which is the most of the enterprise clients that we work with and most of the larger deployments, we use distributed mode and that's how you go. We go with a, uh, we, we change in the latest release, we change and we relax some of that restriction, but we were doing an N by two. Essentially you can have 16 disks and up to eight disks can be lost and you'll still have um, access to your data. That's the type of, uh, series and conservative way we were doing it with some of the S3 um, changes as well as uh, we wanted to relax that and uh, introduce um, more relaxed kind of a policy where you can change the durability of the instead of requiring to have eight disk to be to be the you can go less durable to a four disk or a three disk type of a scenario and we are kind of working it with the user base and uh, enterprise implementations to relax that the reason we feel more comfortable relaxing that kind of a requirement instead of n by two meaning if you have 16 disks a eight disks will be required for your parity uh, because ssd is the use of ssd is making it um, people are getting more comfortable compared to the spinning rust, I call it, the HDD disk. Um, people are much more comfortable in their uh, ability to withstand and they're more durable. Um, there is a couple of years of durability difference between the HDD and SSD. And there's not really good scientific data on it, but the, a few that's been done shows that SSD is proven to be more reliable. So we feel more comfortable with these um, JBOFs, the just bunch of flash or SSD disks that are in the servers, we can relax some of the stringent durability requirements that we had in the earlier days of Minio. Um, other things that we have is we clearly have the encryption per object based encryption. That's also S3 um, compliant uh, feature that S3 has client, client side as well as server side. And we also working on the pieces. There's a couple of, we have full S3 compliance on the encryption side. We just working on two feature set that, um, that's still uh, in the works. That's about multi part uploads that if you have large objects, you chop them into simpler, uh, some smaller pieces and upload, do a put. And we are working on the encryption of those as well as uh, we are working on the on the range gets, which is a you provide a range of the uh, when you're getting an object, you provide the range of uh, bits that you want to pull in, which makes uh, certain implementations 
much uh, much more uh, you can increase parallelism and as well as um, performance so and also lambda compute uh, we also worked on lambda compute in earlier days and we can trigger as it's a similar philosophy that we I mentioned in terms of orchestration. If we are we are the storage system, we are doing storage well, but leave the other orchestration and management task. In this case, um, monitoring or triggering events uh, to other systems. So therefore, we did the integration to Lambda type of uh, computing uh, when you when you have, for example, multiple objects being uploaded into your system, you can trigger events to put metadata if you're uploading checks, if you're uploading different images, you need to classify them, you need to modify them. Instead of um, making it part of the story system, you can trigger Lambda events to, to do processing afterwards. So I covered some of these during the um, initial parts of the presentation, so I'm gonna go very quick on these. We worked on the private cloud different segments on NAS as the Isolon example I provide you. Isolon has their own um, NAS as a file, but we can run on top of Isolon and untouch the original content, but serve them as objects essentially with S3 compliance in the front end. JBuff is the just bunch of Flash. We talk about that. Um, Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry integration as well. Um, in going into the details how the architecture works. I'm gonna go very fast on these slides. Please stop me if you're interested in any special segment or any area. This is exactly describing what I mentioned. Application can have access to the backend straight or through Minio if they needed to do an S3 compliance storage. Um, this JBOF example, I was trying to articulate this very fast, but we believe that with the advances and especially with Skylake, um, there's a, a vector calculation, a, a VX uh, 512 uh, within Skylake chipset that's very critical in terms of um, some of the instructions that um, we believe we can take advantage of. And it improves the performance about one to 10 X type um, in our testing, especially on the hash algorithms and the way we stream and ha streaming hash of the erasure coding that we do in the backend. Um, we really like this technology and we are improving it and one of the one of, uh, one of the folks in at Minio is very, very much specialized on this and um, he's done a lot of work and contributing back to the Go community in terms of the way we use this and he's written a few articles and if anybody is interested uh, I can provide the details on that and enabled with the 100 gig the Melonox has this 100 gig NIC card and some implementations uses 25 gig NIC cards. Once you enable the pipe with the, the 10X performance of the regular coding and storage core performance, and then you combine that with the resting storage um, where the Intel 3D NAND or Samsung and Toshiba, there's a long list of 3D NAND providers in the market nowadays. And um, and any of those combined with that, with an open pipe, we believe is going to enable the object storage to be, become more of a mainstream compared to the last generation or 10 years ago's object storage. And this slide is basically trying to explain that with a, just a bunch of disks, you can, um, you, just a bunch of flash, uh, sorry, using the NAND and 3D, you can get very high density very high performance if you have the right core storage performance like the things that we have done with the fast hash mm -hmm. uh, with AVX 512. So this is the, um, the what, what I mentioned about the Lambda functions, Lambda functions that um, we, we, we implemented in terms of the hooks into different environments, whether it's Elasticsearch or Redis, that when you're uploading, downloading, or modifying certain objects using the Minio storage, you can create the, similar to an audit log or a batch processing, we also included the Lambda functions into that mix. This is um, a, just a slide of how we did the vendor mode, read someone hashing, and as I said, we're 
um, about to change to a different algorithm. All of whatever we do, we always make sure that it's backward compatible with highway has changed. We're going to make sure that everything else is also compatible. This is exactly showing, I think somebody was asking me if we could use the persistent disk with the Google, um, Google storage. This is the depiction of exactly whoever stores to this, whether it's XFS or blob, you essentially use them in a very similar way in terms of the underlying razor code. We call it Excel. Uh, it's just the code name for what we use for the way we do the erasure coding. So if you have um, two disk, I mean, four disk, it will be two data and two parity. And on the right side is just the, the config file or the JSON file that we have for all of the details, what the algorithm we use. The data you see is two, parity is two, the block sizes. If you have a large pile, the block size is like that, but then you put it into multiple parts. So if you look at the bottom part, the number name part one, that's what I was talking about in terms of the uh, multi-part uploads or downloads. All right, so, and the rest is basically the integration into Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry. I'll try to focus on the Kubernetes. I might say that I'm a new um, newbie on Kubernetes, so I'm not the expert, so you guys probably know all the details more than I do. So I'm an expert on other areas, but not on Kubernetes, so just a disclosure. <laughs> so this is just the uh, way we envision or the way we, um, we provide the high-level introduction to how we, how we do the Kubernetes integration or enablement. Um, essentially, if you go to the Minio.io, we have a really nice, uh, simple feature where you kind of translate between the, um, between the um, what you need in an S3, the access key, secret key, the mod, which is how you use standalone version of Minio or the distributed. The examples I've shown you is all the distributed version of Minio. So they are most of the enterprises or larger implementations or deployments, they all use distributed mods. All you do is you put your access key, secret key, distributed or standalone, let's say it's distributed, and you put the number of nodes, in this case, let's say four nodes and the size of the storage, and it generates a file for you that you can do the kubectl create-f and then Minio deployment YAML file and that's kind of the light way work that uh, integration we do. And the same thing, we have the Helm install stable Minio. That's um, pretty much how we integrate it at a very high level. But we are very open to different integrations. And if the community or if the enterprise users are talking to a specific way of doing this or doing the integrations, we are very open to that and we can work with that. But I'm just covering the baseline, how we do it and how we present it to the users and the enterprise community that we have in Kubernetes, how they should be doing. It's a simple, you use the persistence volumes, mapping, and we kind of translate between how Minio works and how you should, how you would you be using your persistence volumes. The second one is basically the work we did very similar to the Azure managed services work. We also integrated natively into, this is more of the same work we did, but a little bit, not lighter integration, more deeper integration because Pivotal similar to Azure is a very close ec ecosystem as most of you might know. So we had to do certain things to kind of integrate with that. This is just uh, showing their dashboard and how uh, Minio integrated into the details of the Pivotal and how a developer can go to marketplace within Pivotal and p pick a Minio instance. And then just like we do with the YAML file and Kubernetes, you put your access key, your secret key, and um, it's just in a closed ecosystem that's fully integrated. That's just what it is in, essentially. And this is just a CLI example of that. And the last page is, uh, this page is the piece about the high level architectural of how you could be using it with, um, with a use case on Cloud Foundry. Um, 
these most of these I covered, so I'm just going to show you some screens. So this is this is basically what we have on the managed services uh, deployment site. If you're not familiar with Azure, this is how you kind of um, deploy the number of VMs that you need, um, your resource groups, and essentially you have a fire load balancer and multiple different um, VMs. In our case, we recommend two, three for multiple um, for our managed hosting um, implementation. And this is just a high level view of how applications interact within the Azure system, whether with their DN DNS or how they would be using the virtual machines. And we have auto scaling enabled in Azure. So if somebody is doing some processing that requires more power, then it just automatically scales fully hands off managed services where you need to have S3 compatible high performance storage against your blob. Hey, Uber. Um, yep. How about the, the service broker? Uh, what, what is that enabling with MinIO? And, and I assume it's really Cloud Foundry today, but what does that look like from a user experience? So service broker in what uh, setup or implementation? I, I think it, you referred to it in the Cloud Foundry setup right now. I think we're talking about doing one for Kubernetes in the future. But what's the user experience like for that if you have it Mini.io configured under Cloud Foundry and, and someone who's a consumer wants to go spin up an app to use Mini.io storage, what's the experience like? So I, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar. So I tried this myself. The user experience in Pivotal is very, uh, very much within the ecosystem of Pivotal. So that's probably not a, so essentially this is the user experience um, initiation. So this is how you go in Pivotal to launch a service. And in this case, you pick the mini object storage as service in that sign there. And then you configure your instance. Once it launches that instance, then it becomes a server endpoint. So you can just do a command line endpoint configuration from an app or a user CLI. Or you can just launch the UI against this instance within Pivotal. So it's a bit close within Pivotal. But if you go to Azure, that's a better example probably from a user experience. Essentially, once you launch this Azure um, managed service, I don't know if I have a good picture of it, but it becomes a managed service or a service running within Azure backed by all the things that you would require, you would get from a cloud, full-blown cloud. A, a load balancer in front of it, a couple of VMs, running the Minio software that's enabling you to access your blob storage that's already existing in within Azure with S3 front end. Okay. Just, let, just to simplify. And the user uses it basically whatever tools that they have or code they have. CLI, let's say, they just introduce it as an S3 endpoint to the front end. So this managed app launches. It is an IP. You take the DNF fully qualified domain name or the IP, introduce it as a CLI endpoint, or you can take that UI. We made it part of this deep integration. We made it so simple for the user. We have a domain name for them where they put their storage account name. Since we have part of this interview process, we ask them for authorization. We, we need to have authorization to use, to access their blob storage. Part of that authorization, we check the storage accounts. Whatever storage accounts that they already have in Azure, we can enable them to reach that blob storage using a UI that Minio has a very light, simple UI that they can use that with their storage account and a full access to their blob storage, upload, download using that, or just use the S3 command set and tools or the code that they already have that S3 against this endpoint. So I think there's, yeah. there's two distinct consumers here um, or, mm -hmm. or two different roles that I'm thinking about. One is the provider and that's the person who's going to go to this Azure console. He's going to go to you know, the pivotal console and they're going to launch mini IO instance to make it available. And yeah. then you've got your developers and your consumers who are just expecting to just get storage from, from somewhere. And That's right. I think that there's, there's a manual approach to it right now, which is, hey, here's your S3 endpoint and just plug it into your app and you know, it's all fine and great. But I think that the, the service broker side of it is more reflecting that, 
hey, a, a user in this space should be able to, you know, work with a standard API or a developer should be able to work with a standard API and use that to actually like to broker or to to create buckets to to you know enable things that 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 they would want or that that are going to help them store their data. Uh, am I Am I misunderstanding that? Like, does Mini.io do that piece of it? Or like, how is the bucket creation actually handled? Or, or is it just so, the instance that's the so, tendency? Yeah, yeah. now I, I get your question. Um, so we have multiple uh, SDKs that we support. And you can use the Mini SDKs to, to, to do that, or the language SDKs to do that just natively. On top of that, we have something called Mino Client, or MC for short, and MC has multiple useful for us administration perspective or creation of buckets. For example, we have an MC bucket command. We have MC upload, download, compare, mirror, copy, all the basic Linux command that you can imagine in the new world of S3. We have put a lot of time and effort to develop this client-based command line tool that's even our competitors uh, use it for moving data, using moving object storage to file, file to object type of uh, scenarios. So in this case, we have that rich tool set, which is very popular in the community. And personally, I really like it too, because it makes life so easier from configuration to movement of data to management of data that can be used, but also the APIs, uh, we have SDKs. And on top of that, if you want to do any kind of automation, like Pivotal needed that. It wasn't create bucket example, but if you say on top of the YAML file we have on Kubernetes, we needed to do a deeper integration where you want to set rules that's going to create buckets, you can just call or you can call MC or you can just, we can do deeper integration that's more programmatic. It, both of them are possible. We just don't know what's needed to be able to kind of do that work or integrate it. But it's very simple for us to do that integration because we are naturally built that way and we can simply integrate. But even without any official integration or work, we can use the MC command line set to do all of the basic configuration and management of objects or buckets. You can just do an MC make buckets and create all the things you need. You can okay. just do a MC config and add all of those endpoints we were talking about, whether it's Azure or Isolon or Kubernetes. Yeah. All right, uh, we've got uh, two minutes left till we hit the top of the hour. Is there anything you wanted to finish on real quick and maybe we have time for one question? Uh, I think uh, I like to do the questions because the rest of them is very high level and we already covered um, most of the things that it's the same thing with Azure, Microsoft Cloud, uh, Google Cloud and Amazon S3. So no need to go into details on there. Okay. So questions. questions, if I may. Go ahead, Seth. One is, um, what is the competitive landscape here? I'm not familiar with uh, this area. And uh, two is, uh, what are your plans uh, with respect to the CNCF? So first question is, we are kind of a different perspective on the landscape of object storage. But if you take the name object storage and the classical players in that area, in open source, we clearly have a lot of traction. But if you mix the commercial implementations of object storage, there are multiple players from CleverSafe, which is now a, a different acquired by uh, IBM, to Cloudian, to Scality, to Ceph in a, in a different way. Most of them has a commercial mixture of file and object storage, but nonetheless ob present themselves as object storage. And they are kind of, um, they've been out in the market for many years, 10 plus in some cases. In our case, we just, focus on to the lightweight cloud native as well as cloud native, meaning the architectural and philosophy, how we designed it multi-tenancy. You can just instantiate or spin off an instance of Minio for each tenant, each department, each area, that nature, that lightness and the strong durable storage core, the implementation of the coding we did. We focus on that and try to 
uh, trade presented into these integrations, all, all the ones that we talk about or within Kubernetes or other areas where that orchestration is done for storage in a very simpler way. So that's what we focus on rather than comparing apples to oranges because all of those other companies started in different era and different segments. So it's kind of hard or unfair to them or to us to compare them one-on-one, -on -one, but that's the market landscape if you look at object storage, if you look around and see who does object storage. Uh, most of them has software or appliance. They have both in some cases, but that's the, how they play it. Whereas we focus on to integration into the modern era, more cloud native type of environments in a very light way fashion as I described, because it's just in our culture and nature. So that's the answer to your first question. Second question is, we really like to see cloud native, uh, I mean, uh, CNCF to, uh, I believe you guys are focusing on block and file already, but there's no kind of a, a driver for the object to be the de facto kind of the, you know, I'm gonna refer to, maybe it's a hidden within CNCF, but like the OpenStack had all those things with Cinder started first and then Manila wasn't there and Manila was created and uh, object was natively there. Whereas in CNCF, I see it as the opposite, like object is there kind of, I'm being reading and bringing it up myself with Rex Ray and other things and, uh, and, and also Rook and other things happening there. But object should, in our belief, with the changes in the market, be another abstraction layer or another driver for integration for CNCF and we would like to help and contribute and uh, listen to you guys how you see it and help in that direction. We want object to be on the radar for the next generation of uh, CNCF. Cool. Does that answer your question, Bob? Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent. Okay. All right, we're, we're past nine o'clock. Uh, anybody else have anything real quick? Nope. All right, Uger, thank you for uh, for presenting to us this morning. I'll have a okay. posted. Sorry. On... Oh, go ahead. Good. Great. Sorry, uh, it was a bit rushed. I was not prepared. I hope I was able to answer your questions and give you an idea of who we are and what we do. Yep. Uh, and if you guys have any other questions, feel free to email the uh, the group, and uh, we'll make sure we get in contact with Uger to get, a, get an answer. But uh, looking forward to you guys participating and, and helping us uh, you know, build community around uh, this, the cloud native storage ecosystem and, and, you know, especially around the, this object space. So very exciting stuff. And thank you for presenting this morning. All right. No problem. Right, thank you guys. For Enjoy the show. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Oh, hey, quick. The, the sure, guy I'm, was doing the presentation. Uh, yeah, I'm could, online. Yep. Yeah. Could you send out the, uh, the slides that you have? Uh, sure, I think we shared it with Clint and he was going to do whatever he, he does okay, with he'll, all he'll the presentation. The yeah, yeah, exactly. But if not, we can definitely resend or okay, just email awesome. me and we'll get you. Okay, yeah. no Thank problem. Thank you much. Cool, no problem.